Um, thanks, Matt, and thank you to all of you for being here um, this morning. I'm going to be talking to you about um, two cost strategies, and they're two cost strategies in what is two very different markets. I also want to talk to you about something um, that some commentators are calling the new frugality. Now, we're not quite 12 months on from when uh, I spoke to the UDIA last year, um, and it's already clear that this frugality is starting to set in the marketplace um, and, and start to have an effect. Now, we got a hint of this around about 12 months ago, and at that time, retail spending was stopping. Um, and then there was this shift. So we started to see people move away from using credit cards and move towards using debit cards and FPOS. I did it myself. I, I didn't realise that FPOS was something that was so easy to use. In a way, this shift is really about people, uh, uh, this um, move from the notions of banks withholding credit to now people choosing not to borrow or being adverse to borrowing. Now, the, the concept of the new frugality is now sort of, it's now better defined. Um, so it's not that people are tight and not wanting to spend money, they actually have money. It's more that they need to have a compelling reason to buy um, and then the product that they're buying has to be of extremely high quality and it has to be valuable to them. It has to make a difference. And we need to understand this because I think it's one of the key things that's in the marketplace at the moment. When those things are missing, a purchaser just doesn't buy. So it's not that he doesn't want to, he just defers it. And it's this deferral that is having the effect down the line. Now in our context, what that means to us is that design is king. Um, it's, it's actually able to sell and people are willing to purchase a compact apartment or a compact space, but it has to be extremely well designed and it has to have um, features in it which are valuable to them. And I think this is one of the lessons that we need to learn. In the, the design of it, it just can't be wasteful as well. It's this notion of that um, we need to be lean in, in the way that uh, uh, we're doing our purchases. So now when we think about construction prices, it's, it's clear that construction prices relate very, very strongly to residential activity. So how busy that market is is what, is what um, drives construction prices. And it's this deferral in the marketplace at the moment that is keeping construction prices down and low and is also keeping this highly competitive market in both the building sector and the civil sectors. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about units or subdivisions, the same conditions apply. Now, at the very same time, um, we have minerals and gas companies that are competing against each other to be first. And it's this competition that is, start, that is creating scarcity for construction services within the resource belt and the mining areas. Places like Gladstone are a great example of this, and it's one that's heading towards a crescendo um, in, terms of its market in terms of construction prices. So this is what I want to talk to you about today, is, is this notion of that there are two very different climates at the moment, um, and I think what we need to learn is, is how to adapt to those different climates. Um, and, and I'll share with you some of, my cost or some of the strategies that I think that will work in these markets. In terms, in terms of the discussion, um, what I want to do is look back first of all. So think about um, some of the stories that we're all a part of. It's working? Yeah. Um, that we're all a part of from that period of 2001 through to today. Um, and I'm going to do that by looking at the Brisbane CBD units. And simply because, not because my talk is about apartments, but because it is a great story of scarcity. So in terms of a construction sense, we had, we've got this great wave of apartments coming through. Then I want to turn to the climates. Um, there's simply what I'm calling the cold climate and the hot climate. Um, and they're differentiated by southeast Queensland, Cairns, northern New South Wales, or all these cold sort of climates. Um, our warmer er or our hot areas, Gladstone, um, Mackay, the surrounding towns, even starting to flow into places like Toowoomba now. Um, and what we'll do is firstly look at what's happening there in terms of prices, and then we'll talk about some of the things that we might be able to do in terms of strategies. And then just before we close, I'll share with you some of the real project costs that we see. This year, rather than stepping it through, I just want to make a data pack available. And for the people that love numbers as much as me, you can um, email us and, and we'll send those out to you. So looking back, um, 
this really, when, when I think about the good times, it was more the periods around sort of 2002 through to 2004, that sort of area, where I saw some of the most successful projects that we're involved in. Yet, when we talk in the marketplace, we talk about the boom of sort of 2007, this type of thing. And really, I want to take us back a bit further and look at some of the things that happened then. First of all, let's just look at Queensland and this relationship between building costs and what the residential market does um, in approvals. So the top line here is construction prices um, in Queensland. So that's a building price index that Mitchell Brantman calculates. And it fluctuates based on a basket of materials. Now it's an average and what people achieve on their actual project, some people buy their buildings far better than that and some will actually pay far more. The green line is residential building and you get this strong relationship. Wow, this is a long way away. So you can see, you can see here how this, this kick um, in, the, in the early years was driven by a population explosion and it pushed through to, um, it pushed through to uh, uh, construction costs and then after that we had a recession and, and costs fell away. In this period through here, which was pretty much all of the 90s until about 2002, building costs didn't change um, and there was very little activity. Even though when you think about 93, 94, this is when some of our best or some of our great organisations got going. Mervac, for example, built its first project um, in Brisbane on Alice Street, round about 93, and then they followed that up with the Port Office Hotel. At the same time, Kevin Seymour was kicking off with things like Admiralty Towers, and David Devine was to, uh, kicking off uh, Cathedral Place down the valley. Now, these were tough markets, and these companies have done, uh, have done good things as they've moved through. So it's a time when you can learn to do things very well. This period here is what was a problem for us in terms of construction costs. It's the end of 2003 and pretty much prices jumped 20% in about a three month period. So this is this crescendo that, that I'm most interested in um, when, we see, uh, uh, um, when we see a push in activity, when things become scarce. This area here, uh, non-residential construction in red, this, these, these bumps, that's the government stimulus package. So the, the first high point here is the first building education revolution release, then there was a second package, and then the third package, the government pretty much cut it in half and it wasn't as big. But you can see that the real trend in activity would have been sort of down here somewhere. Wow, that's wobbly. I'm usually more stable than this. <laughs> Um, and the same here, this is the social building house, uh, the social house building that came through in the stimulus package as well. So you start to see the real effect that the GFC and, and the, this lack of, um, uh, uh, lack of confidence had on our marketplace. Now when we start looking at Brisbane and, and start now um, keying in on the apartment story in the CBD areas, this is just the approvals within 5Ks for apartment buildings more than four storeys. So I'm looking down at a, a tight petri dish area. And you can see that we were, our sales, where sales sort of started happening was actually in the years, in about 2000. And then we saw um, approvals peak in 2001. And then construction costs peaked in 2003. So this is the sort of lag that happens in a marketplace. Um, and, and we'll now turn to, um, um, the actual construction. So you can see this Batman area here. Um, that, was the, that was really the approvals in 2001, 2002, coming through to the actual build. What we're looking at here is research that my old man does for me. And he goes around and he visits every apartment building within that area. And he estimates how long it's got to complete. What we're doing is graphing how many units are under construction at any one time um, uh, in Brisbane, within that 5K CBD area. Now, this curve is the type of thing we're looking at. So you've got a rising market, things are scarce, and then you've got a declining market, um, and how you operate in these different areas. Now, you would think that here, well, this will be gold um, from a tender point of view, but that was actually when we were building our office block. So even though we're looking at a small area, you need to consider it in the whole. 
So our office building was sort of filling that in. There was a period to go to tender in here that was pretty good, and there was definitely a period here. This green is what's being built now. So they're the projects coming through when they started and when we're projecting forward to them finish. To give you an idea of... Huh. I've lost a slide. Oh, there we go. Um, to give you an idea of the projects that were happening that, at that time and, and the stories behind them, there's a whole swag of them that started, that started back. Um, you know, in, and this is when they're being completed. So sort of early 2004 was when we were finishing projects like River Park um, um, Central um, and FKP's 212 on, uh, on Margaret was coming, was coming to completion. Divine was doing things like Casino Towers was completed then. At that time, they were building externally using multiplex. Later, when they did Charlotte Towers, they were building internally, and it was the fastest apartment building that we saw built in that period. Um, when you think about what was happening at that time, as the market was building up, construction got a lot slower. Um, so projects like... Um, Felix that CityMark did is a good example um, where Barclay were building it and the project was substantially behind in its delivery. So it's this notion of the building was tended in a, in a time when uh, things weren't scarce but it was delivered when it was scarce. So uh, these are the types of things that I think we need to protect ourselves from. Here, when Indigo were doing the village centre, that was around about when the city council started waking up and belting us with infrastructure charges. So again, as a market starts to get busier, it goes for a while and then the costs start to come from it and they come, from, they come at you from all directions. Another one I found interesting is um, Observatory Tower, which is just across the road here. Um, you might recall there was a fair amount of um, uh, news media at that time about those contracts where the building was sold very early, it was built later, um, and the contracts were, the developer in that instance was trying to get out of those contracts and resell at what was the higher price. So thinking about costs now and what they did in that period. So the red line is how construction costs went um, um, over that period. And when I talk about what happened in that marketplace, in this area here, just off the graph, sort of January 2002, we were building buildings then for around about $1,230 a square metre, which just seems bizarre when you think about costs now. The sale price for those apartments then was around about $230,000 average for the base apartments. Come February 2004, after when things kicked, we saw costs pushed to $1,610 we were building for, but the sale price almost doubled. So while we had this kick in costs, it was the sale prices that were sort of digging, digging projects out of those problems. Later is when, the, when the, um, the real rot set in. So once we had the kick in prices, they moved 20%, 25%. Then there was the grind, 5% per year, and it just kept going and going and going. Till in 2009, we we're paying about $2,000 a square metre on average. Some jobs, 2,600, 2,700 a square metre. Um, and the base price then, well, the entry price was sort of about 340. So this is the problem that we, that we face when we're in these hot markets, is, is, is knowing where you are precisely in it. So there's some of the stories, and what I'd like to encourage you guys to do is think about the past. It's not what gives you the answers. It's not that the market's always going to be the same. It's just learn from those things and let's set ourselves up in a, in a, in a better way. Thinking about 1993, um, at that time I remember dealing with financiers that were doing deals on barter card dollars. Um, they've learnt this time round not to do that. So these are the sorts of things learned from the past mistakes. Um, now the cold climates. Here we're looking at places like um, uh, Brisbane. Um, at, we move out towards Toowoomba a bit, go down to northern New South Wales. Cairns is certainly very cold. Um, and first of all, we'll look at what the costs are doing there, what we're seeing on costs, and then we'll start moving on to um, some of the strategies. So these are the numbers that I presented in September last year. Um, now, there's a bunch of quantity surveying stuff there, but the, the average for those projects that were tendered about within that three-month period of June through to September was an average of 18.15 per square metre. And I thought then that was as low as prices would get. 
Now what we saw um, in March is that that actually came down further. So that market's getting more competitive. Um, the average is around about $50 a square metre uh, or less. Now when I look at it, it's just kicked up a little bit. So I'm not really seeing that as any, uh, that costs have risen at all. It's more that I think we're at and around the bottom of it. So be aware when we're talking cost per square metre, it's a mixture of um, the market and then it's also a mixture of what design does. So our units have gotten more compact. There's, there's all sorts of things that have changed in this market that makes it more complex. But the notion is these projects are all um, comparable in that they're offered to the same marketplace. When we benchmark, it's not about picking the same designs because you're going to get the answer that yours is good. Um, you really need to look at what your competing products are and how they're achieving the same thing. So the strategy, I think, in a cold market is just take the time. Take the time to get it right. There's no rush at the moment. Things aren't changing in, in uh, um, uh, any sort of fast sense and I don't think they're going to in the short term. Um, if you're in a position where holding costs aren't eating you up, then I think you sit down, you plan your project and you get it right at the beginning. The reason for that is that that's when you can, have the, you can have the biggest effect on the cost of the project, is in the beginning. And that's how we deal with this new frugality. We get projects that are actually um, reflecting our market and tight. It's a great time for creating relationships that count. Um, those organisations that were kicking off in 92 and 93, they made fantastic relationships that served them incredibly well when they move forward in time. Um, because they get needed. Um, a, an interesting one was um, Prop Souls and Hutchinson Builders. <coughs> Prop Souls pr delivered their projects with an external builder in a very hot and heady market without the same sort of difficulties as others. So it's relationships that will work for you. As I said, get it right in the beginning, and then once you build, then you want to build quickly, because then you've got a lot of money going out the door. Um, and that's when you, you can have the biggest effect on interest charges, these sorts of things, and your holding costs start to creep. So do the planning before you hit site, and then go. So the strategy, the roadmap if, roadmap, if you like, for in the cold, there's a lot of stuff on there, and it's just getting to contract. And the reason that there's a lot of stuff there is because you have to get everything right in this market. The margins and the, um, the accuracy levels that we're working to um, are very, very tight. This is the key one for me, is after you get the concept, is work that concept, tighten it up, use this um, comparative analysis to tighten it. Um, 3D design is something that is just a no-brainer at the moment. It brings with it incredible value to your purchases as well as the way you design and work with your project. The extension of that into 5D estimating allows us to look at analysis over and over and over. So this notion of estimating every day or every week is something that is, that is possible now. The technology is here to do that rather than estimating it when I go to tender. Plan to build, use the models to work through it with your contractor so that he's actually starting to make that site more efficient. This is where you can make the next biggest gain. If the builder builds quickly, it's going to be better for everybody and it can only be done through planning. Once you've done that, you've got to wrap it all up in a contract. There's no sense doing all that great work and then entering into a deal that doesn't reflect it. So some examples, this notion of, of working the concept. Um, this is a project that we're, it's in our office at the moment. Um, it's 290 uh, odd apartments. And this is the functional analysis. So on every project, we're keeping these stats, what the residential area is, what the balcony area is, what the car park area is per unit. Um, on this job, it's working out to 108 square metres. And the saleable area, balconies plus its um, uh, internal area, is 66 square metres. The job's about $55 million. Now, when I look at the averages, we start to get these numbers. Um, so we can see it compares fairly well in terms of the, the unit area, but the number that's standing out is the common area. So I'm kind of looking at it and I'm going, what if we just tightened that one thing? The other thing is, is the saleable area is low. Um, so the area that's generating our income is actually low compared to the rest of the building. So I'm also wondering, is this one of those instances where the unit is actually too small? Um, and we've seen that. Where our initial response was, the market's frugal, we've got to get things cheap, so we just squash it. Um, it's now finding that right relationship. So if I just change that one thing, 
um, that circulation space, I would save $6 million on this, on this project um, just by tightening up this design. And this is the power, is in those early times when you're working a project is when you can have the biggest effect. Um, to be able to save that sort of money in a single swipe um, when you're in design and you're trying to do it in finishes, it's impossible. You might get 3 to 5% gain by mucking around with the finishes. You really need to be working with the form and the function of the building. 3D design, um, and this is an example. Um, we're looking at the Stokehouse restaurant that we did with um, Archifield. Um, on that project, there was um, a model that gave us a good indication of what the building looked like, but it merged architecture, mechanical, and structural um, the structural design, so that the designers were able to coordinate it as best they can, not being builders, um, um, but start to get that building uh, a high level of understanding on what is a complex building, um, and it starts to make the, the, uh, the construction more successful. Now, if you haven't been to that um, building, it's worth going and having a look, the Stokehouse restaurant, it's pretty cool, the whole building itself. But the cantilever at the end is 16 metres um, that the, the steel work is spanning on its own. Now, it, it, with, with other types of technology, it wasn't really um, possible. When we talk about 5D estimating and what that is, it's basically I link prices to that model. Um, and we can, you can almost shop around the model. So this window at the end of the Stokehouse restaurant costs $63,000. And you can do that and query the model and how much different things cost. So you can start to get an understanding of where your money's going. You can also look at it in the whole. So you start looking at what would be the effect if I changed all the windows? How, do, how can I convey that to a subcontractor? The subcontractor controls 84% of the price of a building and he's the one that you've got to make savings with, not the head contractor. The next sort of step, this notion of plan to build, is you can have your designers do this, this wonderful modelling, but it needs to kick down the line. You've got to create the value for the contractor. And this is where I think one of those simple changes is take a month. At the moment, we let a contract and we're on the builder's back to get on site and build this building. I need things to happen fast. Invariably, nothing much happens in that month. Um, but if he was to sit down with that model and properly work out how he's going to build it, identify the clashes and the problems in construction, and if that um, amounts to cost, renegotiate those with you, it would be gold. The cost of um, standing steel on a job, on a, an apartment job, is sort of $15,000 a day. So the moment that he hits um, a design clash or something that um, doesn't work, the costs start racking up. If you're doing it pre-construction, it costs nothing. Often it's moving things around and it doesn't even lead to a cost at all. The next trick after that is getting it onto the subcontractor. And these guys are actually looking for this sort of information. Um, I saw at a conference recently a surveyor that is setting out using a robot straight from, the, mo uh, straight from um, the model. It's very, very cool stuff and it will change construction for, um, in the long term. Thinking about your contract and wrapping it up, the things that I think is important um, in, a, in a cold market is when you're negotiating, set the rules. You can waste heaps of time in negotiation and it can go on forever, so make sure you set the rules there. In the contracts, if you're going down this modelling path, make sure they have the permission to do that. These contracts exist now. Um, and definitely address BESIPA. In a difficult market, um, you're going to be faced with claims and BESIPA clauses um, um, uh, the contract needs to be addressed so that you're not ambushed with claims. The carbon price starts Monday, or Sunday probably. Um, same thing, you need, you need contracts that reflect that, that sort of cost as well. If you're faced with claims on the carbon price, really interrogate them, um, because it, it's going to be difficult to show that that cost was actually incurred. From a financier point of view, inform him of all the good work you're doing. Um, if you've got a better designed building, there's less risk and there's less contingency. There's less contingency in the overall funding package. That means there's less equity to get it off the ground. Um, on a $100 million job, you'll save about $8 million in borrowings in terms of what the contingencies are worth. Um, from the construction side of things, expect delays in this market. Um, now, the reason for that is 
Builders are actually tendering to a gazillion subcontractors and they'll be working with people that they don't necessarily know. The quality of work is, um, is waxes and wanes, so there's problems in terms of it, of it coming together. And certainly aim to settle your project before practical completion. Um, it is possible to, ha to have your settlements happening two weeks before your final progress payments due. Um, and again, you're starting to get uh, those whole, uh, you're getting income before you've paid out the rest of, uh, before you're fully drawn. So they're the types of things that I think to apply in a cold market that'll make the biggest difference. There's a heap of them. Um, and that's the difficulty is that we need to get everything right in that sort of a market. Now when we turn to a hot market um, and thinking about uh, what hap what's happening there on the ground in terms of prices, um, I want to first of all have a look at Gladstone. Now I'm just showing three jobs in here and the reason that I'm throwing, showing three jobs is they're almost all exactly the same and they're about a year apart. Now I found this incredibly surprising. In November 2010, we tended a building and it's been built um, and it was 1684 a square metre for around about a five to six storey building. Um, slightly lower than what Brisbane prices were at that time. Um, then at almost exactly the same job a year later is just 1720 a square metre. And then March this year, when I was thinking we'd see prices at 22, 23, 2400, we get a, another, um, another price that comes in at 1782. Now he was the low price out of every, everybody else. And this is it, is it takes a while for the building prices to um, um, reach that crescendo. So we're actually seeing activity in Gladstone being very strong. It's an exciting place to be, but it's not showing in construction prices yet. But in Gladstone, it's imminent. Um, it's only moments away, I think. The reason for that is for the approvals. So here I'm looking at the apartment and housing approvals within those specific regions. Um, it's the spaghetti graph, but the black line's Gladstone. Right? So its approvals have now been building from what is a small base for three years. Um, so there is going to be very, very strong kicks in construction prices in that area very, very soon. The other ones that I think are interesting is Mackay. What's important is what that trend is like compared to its traditional amount. So these are fairly small markets. You know, in, in, um, in Gladstone, you're only talking sort of 1,000 to 1,200 houses a year um, compared to Brisbane is, is when it's performing a sort of 15,000 a year. Um, so th they're small in the overall scheme of things, but the tri trends are very strong. So this is why I think we're now, we're now in a position where it's sort of been okay in these areas, surprisingly, but it's about to go. In terms of the strategy, um, in this market, it's be quick. Um, be quick, sell and build in the same market um, is one of those key things. So um, rather than uh, trying to resell a project, I think you're better off getting into a job, get out of it and get on to the next one. If you've got this land bank that's there, that's gold. Just move through it. Um, but you will see significant shifts in those markets as you move through. You still need to address the new frugality, but in a hot market it's a little bit different. Just make sure it's got valuable features. Thinking about things that are not valuable, um, you know, I remember in the height of the market um, when, when projects started competing against each other for sales. Um, uh, say Aurora was pushing the iris scanner security to access the building as, as being one of its valuable items. Another thing that we did was we pushed out in every job the C-bus type systems. Most of these things, are, 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 um, th they were extremely expensive and now they've been found to not be very valuable. So focus on the things that count, like a really well designed room. A room with a view is far more valuable um, than, a, than a, 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 a sort of technology type feature. Leverage off your existing relationships. If you don't have them already, it's not the time to build them. Um, it's time to just be uh, honest and frank with people and tell them you're a good bloke. It's not to sit there and say, I'm going to promise you five jobs in a row after this. Um, builders, particularly in those areas, will more respond to honesty than they will to um, um, being, uh, being promised future work. Definitely resist bigger is better. So as a market grows, our apartments get bigger, our houses, our lot sizes get bigger, we put more landscaping in, these types of things. Keep it tight and keep it to the valuable type items. And then finally, avoid analysis paralysis. Um, 
If a job isn't working, it probably doesn't work, move on to the next one. Keep looking for the things that are there. Um, and because speed, time is of the essence in these types of markets. In terms of the roadmap, it's the same as the other one, but we just cut stuff out. Um, so this, this area, working the concept, is, is where you have the biggest power. It's what you still need to keep there. The idea of buying someone else's DA and just building it, mm, you know, I'd start to rethink things and see if you can do it better. Be, be wary of what DA times are going to do to you. You don't want to be um, moving into that space. Still use 3D design. It's a no-brainer in explaining what your job's about. Um, but don't concentrate so much on using it for tender and in the construction side of things. Leave it as it is. Just move through the, um, the, the old school way of, um, of building. In terms of costings, it's not so much driving them, it's now leading them. So you start to set the price for things and you negotiate from a known, uh, a known base. So rather than driving it and sort of producing a price at tender, we start to say this is what we want to do this for. This is when it'll work. From the building contract side of things, you'll find it'll be difficult in a hot market for people to take risks they're not used to. Um, so design warranties you're not going to get. DNC is gold, and it's underdone in the market at the moment. So if you can try to get, um, go down a DNC path, it's well worth doing. Um, at the moment, there's only about 10% of the contracts we see in our office um, that are DNC. It's still in this base of 70-odd percent is sort of hard dollar tender. Um, and certainly turnkey is something that's uh, very successful. Ray Whites and Hutchies and guys like that do it really well. They provide you with the format plans and everything at the end of the day. Um, and they solve things like when their units aren't the same area as, as what was sold. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty good way of going that way. Um, some of the hot tips, select your projects cleverly. Um, you know, one of, the best one, of, one of the best ones that I recall through this period um, is, is some work um, that I did at North Quay with CityMark. Um, in that instance, there was an office building. The market was well and truly set, so we had a lot of new office buildings under construction, large office buildings that were sort of three years in delivery. Um, CityMark came up with a building at North Quay that was sort of all done and dusted in, around a, in, in under 12 months. Um, Really clever stuff. It didn't require the D DAs that others required and, and the, the builder could just get in and do, the, um, do the, the refurbishment work. So it was about that particular project, not about where the market was and that type of thing. It was, it was a project that others saw were difficult and they solved that problem and it was extremely successful. Prefabrication will work in these sorts of markets, um, but may, definitely in houses, townhouses kind of, it, it depends. Um, and it's difficult to make it work at the moment in the unit type space. Now the reason for that is because when you start stacking the pods, you duplicate the walls. So um, every time you put a, a, a pod together, you've got two walls, and when you put them on top, you've got a, a, you're d duplicating on a floor and a ceiling. Um, it's only in a hot market that you'll be able to recover those things, but sometimes it, it, it's difficult to do. Um, because the actual construction costs underneath, underneath sort of um, prevents it. But innovative design can get around that sort of thing if, you, if you're willing to um, um, work it out. In terms of things to be aware of, approval delays. If you think back to 2003, um, I think everybody in this room and the, all the people that aren't in this room were complaining about the approval process within Brisbane City Council um, and with the Gold Coast City Council. These corks is what happens in those sort of marketplaces, so plan for them, um, particularly in small areas where they, where they haven't got very many, um, very many staff. The other thing you'll see is that the authority charges will start to rise. This is happening very strongly in places like Moran Bar at the moment um, for temporary accommodation as well as, as um, full-time staff. And a key one in these areas is electrical supply. So we've got a number of jobs at the moment where there's a two-year wait to get the electrical supply on. Um, so it's worth um, doing some digging around this, find out what that issue is about, um, and you can enter into supply agreements with the authorities beforehand, novate them to your civil contractor um, when it comes into place. Um, this style of thing are the sorts of things to check out. In terms of the contract um, and what it needs to do, um, I think the key thing here is, is um, 
when, when, when you're looking to, to call prices for your, for your building, if you haven't got those relationships there, you're stuck with the pricing in town um, and you may have to look outside town to get a better price. Um, by way of example, townhouse project in our office this week, um, no, end of last week. Um, prices there were around about 1,700 a square metre for just for some um, simple sort of townhouses. There was an out-of-town builder that did it for $1,250 a square metre. Um, so it's this notion of, is there someone outside of town that's going to come and do this? I mean, in town, in town we have some excellent regional, regional builders. I mean, Woolham's are here today, but Hutchies do it well, Carmichael's, um, McNabs, there's a whole swag of them that are good at building in these areas. And they're not local guys, they're sort of moving in and out of town. Um, but that local market of the actual builder that lives there is, is where you might have to um, look a little bit further afield. Certainly go down the DNC sort of path and shift the risk. Um, in those sort of markets, you can get your building together a bit quicker. Um, make tendering easier for these guys. If you're going to be calling prices, keep the list small. Two or, th two or three prices, three's good. Um, make sure all of them know they've got a chance to win this work. You're not just dicking them around with the job. If they want quantities, give it to them. Um, and certainly try, and, uh, 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 try not to reprice the job over and over as designs are changing. So get one price and then negotiate the answers. The construction time, be wary of it. Both, both cost and time is going to overrun in these types of markets. Um, slightly different to before, but it's more the rising cost and the issues that, say, Barclay had on Felix. Um, be wary of acceleration claims. If a job is, in, is a basket case, it's often difficult um, to dig it out by throwing money at it. Um, but sometimes it works, but I would put um, conditions around those acceleration payments, sort of performance type things. Keep the construction easy and avoid purchase of variations, avoid tenancy works, allow them to do that stuff once you're out of there. So they're the, they're the, site, they're the, they're the types of strategies um, that I think. The overriding thing is in the cold market, take your time and get it right. In a, whole, in a hot market, move as quickly as you can. Still be efficient and address the important things, but move through the job as quickly as you can. Now turning to real, the, the sort of real costs um, that we're seeing in the marketplace and escalation, I just want to give you a summary of where this, where this is standing at the moment. Um, so the top line, we've got apartments, more calling it multi-res this year because most, most of the jobs are sort of fitting in this 9 to 16 storey category. The tall towers are not so much happening at the moment. Um, the target that I think to be aiming for is in, in this sort of mark, 1766. If you get there, you're doing very well. The sort of top price is in the 1900s. Um, and we're seeing prices that, there's actually prices above that, but your designs, you should be able to work and fit within that bound. On the sub, uh, sorry, that band. On the subdivision side of things, the target's sort of 65 to $70,000 a lot, including headworks in terms of the projects that we're seeing. Houses is around about $1,000 a square metre, slightly up on what it was last year. Um, and townhouses is sort of 1284 to 14, 1443. These are, the, these are the areas where I would be pitching, pitching the projects for. And I'm, being a QS, I'm always aiming for that lower number, I suppose. Um, but that's the sort of range. Now, in terms of the elemental data behind this, it's, it's, it's all in spreadsheets. And if you're interested in that sort of information, just email us and we can provide it to you. When we look at the data, um, apartments at the moment, the average area is 79 square metres. So this is... 14 jobs that are currently being built. Um, the balcony areas are 13 square metres and the cars are 31 square metres. So this is the sort of functional targets um, that you should be aiming for if you want to meet the average. Subdivisions, the average lot size is a 560 a square metre. Parks are 60 square metres per lot um, and the roads are running at a, or just under 100 square metres per lot. Um, roads varies quite a bit. so. Again, the, the, this information, the detail of it is in the, the elemental spreadsheets that we have. Um, houses are 180 square metres, the patios are 15, and all the houses we see are four beds. They're not four beds plus study. That's 55 houses in the last three months that are in those figures there. 
Um, and the townhouses are sort of 104 square metres, seven square metres for balcony. And cars, it's, they're all in garages and it's just one car space, a tight, tight sort of a lock-up garage. In terms of escalation, I don't think we'll see anything much happen in the next year. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, it, 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 from a building pr point of view, we really need to see this shift um, in, in confidence and it would seem every time that we hear some more bad news out of Europe, we look at ourselves and just go, oh, well, this, you know, it's continuing. Um, until we get that confidence in there and a compelling reason to buy, I can't really see it changing and flowing through to construction prices. Um, in terms of the regional areas, it's very, very specific. It depends on what's happening in that market in that particular time. You could find that there are um, three construction camps being tended in Gladstone at the time that you're trying to put your little townhouse development together. Um, so we want it, you need to be aware of what's going in that marketplace. My final words, um, the market's tough. But what, what I like about this sort of market, it's when really good organisations get going. They, 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 they do everything particularly well because they have to. Um, understand the new frugality and what it means and then adapt to the climates that you're operating in and make sure that you're working and using your wisdom and your intelligence in terms of factual and market data and then leveraging off that with technology to do these things quicker than you've ever done it before. Thank you very much, I hope. That was useful. <laughs>